the the Google Doc up. Yeah, the Google Doc. Yeah. Yeah, I see it also. 23. Yeah, yeah I see it also. 23. YouTube. Yeah. I, I muted YouTube, yeah. I wasn't able to until you started it, and then I forgot to. I see the chat. Yeah. Is it the size of your window? So if you heard me, then everybody could hear us, right? <laughs> All good, fellas. Hello everyone and welcome to another Fusion 360 Live. Uh, we're doing another CAD Hangout. We have a couple guest speakers with us today. Um, you'll notice Kevin Kennedy. Um, he's from Product Design Online. Uh, he's been doing quite a few tutorials on Fusion 360. I also have my buddy Angelo with me. Um, he's been doing a lot of the, the CAM tutorials. So we're just gonna do another CAD hangout with you guys. Um, if you have any questions, go ahead and uh, post them in the chat. We'll try and monitor the chat and see if we can answer those questions. But I wanted to bring Kevin um, and Angelo on just to learn more about some of the people that are using Fusion 360. Now, what's cool about Kevin is he doesn't actually work for Autodesk. He's been doing this by himself on the side. So Kevin, why don't you introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about yourself and we'll we'll go from there. Yeah, uh, thanks Brad. Um, so I'll, I'll give you a little background, I guess, to how I got started posting tutorials. Um, and to do that, uh, I'll take you through, I guess, how I, I got into CAD as a profession. So I was fortunate to get introduced to CAD at a pretty young age compared to most. So. I think I was probably like 12 or 13 when I first started dabbling in CAD. Um, and my interest kind of stemmed from woodworking and some other hobbies that I picked up when I was younger. 
And I just thought it was so fascinating that you could create these three dimensional objects, you know, and do all this stuff digitally. Uh, so I, I think the very first program I learned was Pro Engineer, which is probably one of my least favorite now. Um, and if anyone else has used it, I'm sure they're, they're well aware of the pain points that, you know, it presents. Um, so fast forward, I was then introduced to Autodesk Inventor, um, and that actually got me stemmed into kind of the design and engineering field. And I went on to study industrial design um, at a university. And that's where I was somewhat forced to learn SolidWorks um, because that's kind of the industry standard in terms of product design. And that brought me, I guess, into kind of this combination of using SolidWorks and Fusion. I think when I was learning SolidWorks, um, which was a pretty easy transition because once you learn one, it's kind of easy to hop to others. Um, during those years, that was when Fusion had first come out. And I remember the Autodesk reps coming to our campus, like trying to get kids to sign up and trying to, to kind of promote it. And just being honest back then, it was, it was just, it was awful um, because it was so new and there was just, it was lacking so much. And I remember everyone was trying it and just like, how, how do we transition from something like SolidWorks that has everything to something so new? But at the same time, I remember talking to the guy about kind of the, the five-year plan of Fusion and being so excited about the sculpt workspace and all these other things. Um, so during that time, while I was in school, I helped out at a 3D printing lab. And we also, we had uh, community classes where we would teach Fusion uh, to community members and other college students and basically anyone who was willing to learn. And that kind of stemmed, I guess, my excitement and passion for teaching um, because I realized during that moment that there's so much opportunity for people if they can learn a program like this, but I believed like it didn't take a four year degree. You know, someone could learn it if they were just willing to kind of put in the time. Um, so I guess fast forward to where we are today. Um, so I work full time as a product designer and a few years after graduating, I had kind of missed that in-person teaching that I had um, while I was in school. And I also helped out like in a maker space and a few other things. And so one day I was just sitting there thinking like, how can I reconnect with people? How can I help them learn, you know, this? And, and how can I do this without like limiting myself to 10 or 15 students in a classroom. And so that was kind of what I guess kicked off my YouTube channel. I decided, you know what, I'll, I'll just start posting videos online and see if anyone, you know, wants to watch them. And then I guess the rest is history. So here we are, and it just kind of took off. And now it's kind of become a part time job because I spend so much time doing it, but I really enjoy it. 50,000 plus subscribers later, right? I mean, it's so yeah, let me bring up if you guys haven't um, seen it yet, make sure you go out and look uh, for product design online. This is uh, Kevin's channel. And you can see that he has a ton of videos out here. Um, some of them are only just, you know, five or six minutes long. And some go into more detail and stuff like that. And obviously, you know, his hobbies are in here. And um, but I actually watch these videos myself. Um, I love teaching, just just like Kevin and uh, and Angelo. Uh, but I also like learning and watching some of these other tutorials that people are doing. I learn little tips and tricks, and oh, it's a great idea and stuff like that. So, uh, for all of you watching right now, if you haven't um, checked out Kevin's channel, please do. Um, it's an incredible resource. I really like him because um, he goes at a really um, smooth, easy to understand pace and um, you know just kind of talks about different ideas well you could do it this way let's do it this way you know he'll show a couple of different methodologies which I think is great because you know the questions we get all the time are like well you know how would I go about approaching designing you know this phone holder or something like that right and there's you know six different ways eight different ways you could do it and watching somebody else walk through the steps I think 
is the best way to learn. I mean, I do the same thing with woodworking. So I think it's cool, Kevin, that you do a lot of woodworking. I also do a lot of woodworking. Um, and I love watching videos of people, you know, turning segmented bowls and all this kind of stuff. And, and I learn a lot from that. So, um, so Angela, what's, you're going to have to unmute, but what's your background? Let me unmute. Okay, guys. So my background, man, how far do I need to go back? <laughs> All right. Yeah, we're, we're a little bit older than Kevin. Yeah, so <laughs> 1988. Uh, so when I was younger, my father worked as a CPA, a bookkeeper, and he worked at a large machine shop here in the San Francisco Bay Area of, an, of a family friend of ours. And I would always go there and hang out during the summer when I'm not in school. And uh, when I uh, finished, finished with school, I would uh, spend more time there. And I remember as a young guy, uh, they were doing some uh, turning operations on some sta stainless steel flanges. So they set me up on a manual lathe to just turn the front face of the, the flanges and then turn the OD and turn the O-ring uh, groove and things like that. And then they put me on the Bridgeport mill to drill the bolt circle. And over time, I, I learned more and more and I got really hungry for it. So I went to uh, school to learn how to do machining and uh, I'm not going to get into all types of details, but uh, uh, yeah. And just one thing led to another. I worked at many Bay area uh, machine shops, started my own CNC shop, mm -hmm. had that for a while, worked at some uh, various companies. I worked uh, at Tesla and their R&D prototype machine shop. I worked with some really smart guys there and uh, I'm still in touch with many of them and uh, some are still there, uh, but most have moved on to other places and they work for some very well-known companies, uh, high-tech companies uh, that we all know by, by name. Uh, I'm not gonna really uh, talk about, you know, what they're doing because a lot of it's uh, proprietary, but uh, yeah, man. Uh, landed at Autodesk and just love it. Love helping the community. There's a huge community of machinists on Instagram that we uh, uh, dialogue with a lot. Uh, so, man, I've been doing it for a number of years and I still love it as much today as I did the first day. Just super hungry. And uh, I love the, the way Fusion allows users to um, just have access to the CAD and the modeling and also the CAM side of things for a very low uh, cost of entry. Uh, so yeah, it's just cool being part of this community and now being doing designing and CAD and CAM is cool. But I remember, man, in the late 80s, early 90s, it wasn't like the cool thing to do or people didn't even know what a machinist was. So uh, yeah, it's cool yeah. to be part of. It's awesome. Yeah, they, they would type in the numbers on the controller themselves, right? Instead of using yes. CAD. I mean, it was you know, you had to be pretty good at it. So, um, yeah. Kevin, I think it's cool. We actually have a very similar background. So I, I didn't think I mentioned this on the last CAD chat where same thing as, as a youth, I got invited to Hewlett Packard and saw somebody had done something in this wireframe CAD model. And I thought it was the coolest thing. When I got into high school, they had AutoCAD, you know, back then but my teacher had never used it. So he had, he had me come up with a curriculum. He's like, tell me what you want to do. And I had to you know, do this proposal. And then he's like, yep, go ahead. And loved it so much that I wanted to do it for the next semester. And he goes, I have nothing for the next semester. So he just basically let me you know, play around with the product and stuff. And that's what got me into the architectural side of things. Um, and then just like Angelo, um, when I was in college, hanging out with all my machinist friends who were in, um, you know, the manufacturing side of things i was like wow that's really cool you can make stuff with your hands and with the computers and stuff and that's when i switched over to mechanical so um so kevin with with your um youtube channel you have lots of t different topics and stuff so i was just mm -hmm. kind of curious i mean, this is more for me personally like how do you come up with the topics that you want to cover and then you create these videos for Ooh, that's a good question um it really depends. I like to do as many crowdsourced like questions or topics as I can. Um, part of it, I would say, I try to find a balance of covering topics that maybe the Autodesk channel doesn't, you know, necessarily cover, um, or things that 
maybe stem off of like a, a live stream or, or like a tutorial that you guys do that kind of sparks my, my mind. Um, and then I would say the other part of it that's tricky is trying to find things that are heavily searched on YouTube, mm -hmm. right? And I think that's part of what helped my channel grow is kind of finding that balance of giving people what they want and giving YouTube what they want and, and you know, the things that kind of perform well and just making sure that overall, like, it's all about, like, my biggest thing is I always kind of ask myself, like, will this topic help someone learn, like, several different concepts, you know, mm -hmm. and I try to make sure that it's kind of a project that can dabble in, like, several different things. That way, they kind of get that whole picture. And it's not just like, here's how to do one feature, or here's how to do, you know, just how to do this or that. So just kind of depends. But yeah, yeah, I guess yeah. I'll ask you though, because I'm, I'm curious how you guys <laughs> at, at Autodesk come up with topics if it's, you know, as a larger group or if kind of individuals just do their own thing or how does that kind of work? It's, I would say kind of similar, honestly, like, you know, I, I monitor the, uh, the Fusion 360 uh, Facebook group. Um, you know, doing these live streams, people will make comments like, oh, it'd be really cool to see this and this, you know, like advanced surfacing or sheet metal or whatever. But it still blows me away that, you know, you do a topic that you're like, eh, whatever, but it gets like huge number of views. And then there's another topic, I'm like, oh, this is the coolest thing out there. And it's like, oh, like, you know, a couple thousand maybe or whatever. So it's, yeah, it's really kind of funny. Like, um, so, so at first, and you know, if you go to my personal channel, you'll see, you know, I've done some woodworking, um, live streams and stuff like that, or topics and stuff. Cause just like you, Kevin, I did, I used to do a lot of woodworking and stuff. Now we, um, like Angelo and I work together uh, quite a bit with like, you know, doing the whole idea to a part in your hand uh, methodology so you know you come up with an idea you use fusion to model that tweak it make changes then you add it to you know tool paths and then you send it to a machine and that's where angelo has been doing a couple of live streams on you know physically modeling this uh manufacturing the part which i find extremely interesting and i wish i knew more about it so um make sure you guys watch angelo's live streams if you haven't already so he, he goes into depth like you know different cutting methodologies etc so um and then just something that's interesting like that whole laser light projector thing i was like i want to do something where it's not just a bracket it's not just a single part it's not a cell phone holder it's it's a whole product you know um and it was just laying around it was broken so i took it apart and reverse engineered it and learned a lot from it and I would, you know, I would go back and do it again, maybe even differently than how I did it the first time, just because what I've learned um, going through it the first time. So, so yeah, it's kind of hard to say. It's just like, yeah, whatever a, a pops good in mixture. Your head. Of, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, That's I'm cool. similar, yeah. Yeah. Similar for me. I just get questions a lot. And then I, I have an ongoing list that I have it written down, but also I have a bunch of stuff in my head that uh, some of the common questions that I get. And so I use that to drive. And then like Brad also said, uh, based on some of the user input uh, during these live streams, they say uh, like the metric thing. Uh, I noticed we do a lot of the people in the States here do everything in inch. And some users, I, I'll, I'll view the comments and they say, why do you always do everything in Imperial? So my last live stream I did in metric just because of that. Yeah. And actually, Kevin, another one. So you mentioned, do you teach at local makerspaces? And so do I. And I get a lot of my topics from there because to me, that's like the, the freshest, I hate to use that term, um, knowledge, you know, because like some of these people have never touched a CAD system before, but they want right. to use it to make something, you know, um, to some that have been using it for 30 years or using CAD for 30 years. Where So it's a really good way for me to get like a, a, a pulse of what are the kind of questions we typically get. Um, and so I love, love teaching those classes, um, and, uh, getting to use all their equipment and stuff is pretty fun. <laughs> so. Yeah. No, I, I think those are a good reminder of what it's like to start over again. Like I think as a teacher or educator, that's like the hardest thing in any field, let alone something as complex as CAD or fusion, that if you're using it for several years, you start to forget the little things that a beginner may face. And 
I would say, and I, it, it definitely, I've watched several of your live streams. It seems like you understand that as well, but you have to constantly reflect on like, what would a beginner be asking here? What are mm -hmm. some potential issues that may come up? What are things that, you know, they may not really understand that they need to know, or what are things that they can kind of learn later on and stuff like right. that? Yeah, I, I find that the hardest because like there's shortcut keys or the S key, or if you hold down shift and click here, you get a, you know, a quicker way and people will make that in the comments. Well, you could have done it this way. And, and yeah, absolutely. And I'm glad that they know that, but I usually try and kind of do the, the bell curve of knowledge, you know? Right. Um, so people that are watching our videos can, can learn from it and learn some new tips and tricks and, and uh, move forward. So that, that leads into a, a question. So you teach Fusion 360. How did you learn Fusion 360? Um, so I kind of touched on it briefly, but I would say when I was, I was using SolidWorks for several years. And actually at one point I was running a SolidWorks user group mm -hmm. um, and helping teach it to, to people as well. So that was when I, I had an interest in Fusion, um, particularly because of two things. One, the sculpt workspace was really exciting when it first came out. Mm -hmm. And then two, the fact that it actually worked on Mac because mm -hmm. I'm a big Mac guy just because I use several other design programs that are only available on Mac. And that was always my one pain point of like largest pain point of SolidWorks because I would always have to run Windows on my Mac or go use another computer. And it just was so frustrating because I was constantly having to go back and forth. And so um, I remember that was like one of the things when I first tried Fusion, I was like, oh, finally, someone cares about Mac users. <laughs> and <laughs> And you know, looking back too. now, it's yeah. like, it's kind of crazy that there wasn't something earlier on for Mac that was, you know, as serious. There were some other programs, but they were more of like, you know, a basic level. Um, so I guess a lot of the transition was easy for me. And I think like a lot of people find that transitioning from SolidWorks or Onshape or some of these other programs, the, the fundamental concepts of CAD still exist and kind of transfer from one to another to another. The challenge with switching to fusion is just understanding the nuances of fusion, like bodies and components and, mm -hmm. you know, the cloud based aspect. A lot of people get caught up in like, I don't see the file on my desktop. Like where did it, you know, where is it safe to, you know, things like that. Yeah. So I think a lot of it is it's an easy transition. It's just accepting that it's just going to take some time to actually learn those kind of quirks and nuances and just kind of transition. But honestly, it all kind of happened over several years. Um, and I used to work like solely in SolidWorks. And then, I don't know, one day I just got to the point where I was like, I'm using Fusion just as much. Like, there's no point in using both. Like, I'm just going to switch over. And, you know, if there's something, a feature that's missing, I'll just make do without it. I'll figure out how to get it, you know, to work elsewhere. So, yeah. Uh, kind of a funny story. My uh, daughter's boyfriend goes to the School of Mines, or actually, he's graduated. Um, and they required to use SolidWorks for their product design. And he would do all of his homework on Fusion <laughs> and then bring it into SolidWorks, you know, because he found it so much faster in Fusion yeah. to get his idea out of his head and, you know, onto the screen and stuff. And then he would remodel it in SolidWorks and turn it in. But it was pretty funny. And, and they actually, this is kind of cool, they, they invented a really cool product and won a huge competition. They got like a hundred thousand dollar grant, um, and they're using Fusion for for this device. And I can't talk about it until it's released, but it's pretty impressive, actually. So, um, you mentioned bodies and components. What what would you say was your biggest speed bump learning Fusion? Like, what was coming from like you said, SolidWorks, Pro E, et cetera, into Fusion? What was the the biggest thing that you thought was kind of difficult to? Yeah, grasp? I mean, I would say, and I see this a lot even to this day. Um, and I love the use of joints now and how fusion treats assemblies and the whole difference between, you know, bottom up and the top down approach. Um, but I would say just having used SolidWorks for so many years, it was just so ingrained to like create everything individual, mm -hmm. insert them into an assembly file, mate them together. And just like, you were so used to like doing that. It was hard to like break that habit and that mold of just like starting a file a certain way. And 
looking back now, like it, it's almost like hard to believe like that is such an industry standard because it just takes so much more time in mm -hmm. the fusion way. I love how you can still do it both ways. You know, a lot of people are like, oh, well, why did Fusion do it the opposite way? But, you know, really you can you can do it both ways, which I think that's more valuable than anything because you can kind of decide at the beginning of a project which way is really best for the project. Yeah, it, it, that, I totally agree with you. In fact, that's why I did that laser projector is because I always did it the other way. That's that's what I was used to. I never had, you know, I never designed one part, saved it, designed another part and then brought it together. And I know a lot of people are used to that methodology and it's, you know, 20 plus year old methodology. Why is it that way? And that's just, it's how the product was designed. And so they actually design their products because of those restrictions and fusion allows right. you to do either or. Um, in fact, another funny story. So I came from Hewlett Packard and in Singapore, they have a, a room of every single printer, desk jet printer that HP has ever made. And you, from the very first one to the current ones, and you can literally see when the CAD system changed, when they added variable fillets and all of a sudden the printers had variable fillets. And then when they added, you know, draft or whatever, and they all had draft, it's really kind of funny. You can literally see the history of CAD in the design of the printers, you know, and then when they had surfaces, they all work, you know, kind of curvy surfaces. And then Apple started doing the plane design, right? And everything switched back to the plane design. It's, right. It's kind of interesting, but so, um, a question I got asked last time, and you mentioned you went to college for industrial design, and somebody asked a really good question about like, if their kid is interested in CAD, in design and stuff, what would you tell them if they walked mm -hmm. up to you and said, hey, what would you, how would you guide me? What, what would you tell yeah. them? Um, I guess first off, I would say, echoing what Angelo said, I think, I mean, even when I was first learning CAD, when I was, pretty young there was kind of a stigma that like cad was for nerds cad was you know cad's kind of a very like niche industry like you know there's not many jobs stuff like that and i mean my, the first thing i always tell people is that that's not true at all like especially today and then going off of that there are just so many different areas where you can use cad you know angelo's a good example of how it's used in the machining world. My, my expertise and background is more in like physical product design and plastics and, and kind of consumer goods. And then going off of that, there's even just so many other aspects like using it for solely for prototyping, like 3D printing or, you know, other prototyping machines and different things. So I would say like the first thing I always try to tell people, especially like younger kids or adults that are interested is like don't get caught up in like you have to go down like a single route because once you like can use the program well enough you can really kind of go in, in several different directions and i think like that's a challenge with like the way universities are set up because a lot of people they i picked a major and now i'm stuck with it you know and they feel like oh now i have to graduate with it and i have to go do this career and i think like as a society that's starting to change a lot and even the current situation with remote work and like things are, are changing a lot of different companies and how they operate. Um, so I, I would say just to kind of summarize, like stay open-minded and focus on just like understanding the core principles of CAD. And I think like several different doors will open up and you'll kind of be able to figure out your path as things kind of, you know, evolve over time. Yeah, and Fusion is such an awesome tool for that because you can do industrial design, product design. It's got ECAD, so you can do electrical engineering. It's got manufacturing. It's got rendering, which you know could lead you into you know the film industry or whatever. There's there's a lot of areas. So I totally agree with you, Kevin. I thought that was an awesome answer. Um, yeah, and and the same thing happened to me. I wanted I wanted to be an architect. I wanted to design houses. I didn't care about skyscrapers or bridges or anything like that. But am I doing that now? No. And I've talked to a lot of architects and they're like, don't ever go into the architectural field. <laughs> you know, it's, and so I'm kind of glad I didn't. You know, I started in civil and now I'm in mechanical, right? And look where I am now. And I'm getting to use this fun tool every day. So, so awesome. Um, 
So Ayal asked, uh, we want Kevin to elaborate on, quote, his other hobbies. So you mentioned and some other hobbies, so if you don't mind elaborating. Yeah. Um, I would say my biggest hobby is woodworking. I kind of touched on that some. Um, and I'm, uh, I'm kind of interested in woodworking from a furniture design standpoint. And that's kind of what I've always kind of done. Um, and that's, that's a combination of like one-off projects that are for myself, like something that's maybe, you know, unique to my house or like something I need. Um, and then also kind of one-off projects for friends or like every once in a while I'll, I'll do kind of like a, a contract or like a client type project, um, just for, for the sake of fun. Um, other hobbies. I've been 3D printing for, for quite a while, um, but I don't, I, I find myself printing stuff so much for like actual design work that it's kind of lost that luster to do it like after hours because I've just done it so much that like over time, it's just not as exciting and, you know, it just sometimes I'm just like over it and dealing with all the problems and other stuff. Um, other than that, I would say I'm a, I'm a big outdoors person. Um, so I live in the Seattle area now, so I'm always hiking or mountain biking or just doing something to get outside. I think that's one of the downsides of like being a product designer or in the CAD profession is that you're always glued to your computer and like, it's great because you can travel. And I, and that's what I love about fusion and the cloud aspect is now more than ever, I've been able to kind of just get work done anywhere and not be tied to like my home desktop or like a certain hard drive or something. Um, but at the same time, I find like, sometimes I'm just like, oh, I need to get off this computer. You know, I've been staring at it for 10 hours, like, and so that's why I like going outside and just trying to do, I guess, outdoor activities and stuff like that. Do you ever find yourself walking around and like looking at things going, oh, that's a variable blend fillet or you oh, know, all the time cur curvature continuity or that's a yeah. g2 surface yeah I, it's really weird I, you know just our, i guess that's our profession we're just used to looking at things and yeah well, I, I find <laughs> myself i've seen this as a common theme especially with like industrial designers you'll get like a new product and then before you even use it you're wanting to tear it apart to see how <laughs> they did something because you're like you're confused like or how did they do that and then you're like oh okay yeah. And then you're like, oh, crap, now I have to put this back together and hope it works. I did that with my first Rubik's Cube. <laughs> <laughs> so, Angela, same question for you. Like, you know, you mentioned you used to have like a, a CNC shop and I know you have a lot of other hobbies. What do you? Yeah, yeah. So I, I ran a CNC shop for a number of years, uh, worked at many different shops. But some of my hobbies are uh, painting, art. I like to. I'm an ex-graffiti artist when I was younger. I used to do aerosol art. And uh, so now I still paint, but now I paint on canvases. And uh, so I do still do that. I do an abstract style. Uh, bicycling, I've been on a bike since I could remember. And I raced when I was young. And as an adult, I race road, road cycling. So that's how I stay active. That's how I got these funny tan lines here. These <laughs> very distinct tan lines. My legs look the same. Uh, so I ride my bike as much as possible and then uh, jujitsu also. Uh, so try to stay active, uh, family, of course, things like that. Cool. Um, so for, this will be for both of you guys, because I think this is an interesting question. If you weren't in the CAD field, what do you think you'd be doing? Ooh. <laughs> I, I would say echoing kind of going off of the, uh, my complaint about being on the computer all day some days i sit there and I, I especially when i am working on like a woodworking project or something i think man i wish i was just doing this full time because i just mm -hmm. i'm more active i'm moving around like i'm doing different stuffs um so i would say like i would probably potentially be like a woodworker or furniture maker or something like very specific so not necessarily like a a full on wood shop and more just making like one off projects for for clients or things like that. Um, and the other thing potentially would be, which I guess is bad in the sense of being on the computer a lot again, uh, would be something with computer programming. Um, that's something I've dabbled in on the side. 
and I do some basic programming and, and stuff like that. And I'm always fascinated with just how things are made. I mean, even things like fusion, just the amount of like man hours and effort that goes into it, but how much value that can create in so many different ways. Uh, so I always, looking back, I always thought like, if I didn't choose industrial design in college, I probably would have stud studied uh, computer science mm -hmm. and then found myself working in software, like somehow connected to the, the design field, whether it be like CAD or just something else that's kind of in that same realm. Cool. How about yeah. you, Angela? Yeah, I, growing up, I always wanted to be a pilot and I was, I was always fascinated by that, just being able to fly and so I always wanted to be a pilot. A pilot. I wanted to go to the Air Force and be a fighter pilot. And then, uh, like I said in my uh, earlier, how I fell into machining. I didn't grow up wanting to be a machinist. Uh, I just kind of fell into it based on uh, the machine shop my father was working at. So I just fell into machining. But I always grew up wanting to be a pilot. That's uh, funny. I didn't know that, Angela. I, I actually did too. I actually applied for the Coast Guard. I wanted to fly helicopters for the Coast Guard. But oh, cool. I, I was colorblind and they kicked me out. So. Oh, man. <laughs> okay. uh, my, my hearing is terrible from, although my, my hearing is bad from being in a machine shop for 30 years. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, just being exposed to all the noise of the shop, especially the air blast, things like that. So uh, a lot of times uh, I'm talking to someone or someone's talking to me and I say, what? Huh? <laughs> and kids get very frustrated with me because they say something they have to repeat it a few times. So. Yeah, Angela and I did a, a live stream from Pier 9, which is in San Francisco. We have a whole bunch of machinery down there, and they have all these sensors in the room, what the audio level was. And I kept finding myself looking over going, are we being too loud <laughs> or whatever? But it's like it's kind of a cool safety thing. I mean, it's it makes sense. So, so Ron Owensby says that in Kansas, it's called a farmer tan. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's perfect. Yeah, farmer tan. <laughs> but... Um, okay, so yeah, and I appreciate the people posting questions, keep them coming. I, um, actually, Angelo is kind of going through and looking at them. And, and so Daniel asked a question toward me. He says, can you do architectural design in Fusion 360? And the answer is, yeah, I mean, you can. Is it the best tool in the toolbox? I'd probably say not really, because for example, you know, tools that are designed for architectural design have, you know, predefined windows and doors and stuff like that. They're kind of, you know, they try and speed up the process. Now, with that said, I've used Fusion um, to design when my kids were in a play at the school, they, they wanted it to look like a big, huge pirate ship. And they had singers up on the top of the pirate ship and all this kind of stuff. And the director wanted to know how much is this going to cost and all that kind of stuff. So I mocked up the whole design in Fusion, you know, took measurements of the stage and everything. And I was able to say, you know, we need, you know, 64 two by fours and this and that. And I even used FEA um, to check loads, you know, like were there enough joists to support, you know, 10 teenagers and stuff like that on this stage without the risk of them falling through yet keeping the cost down by not over engineering it. Um, so, and then little things, and I should probably do a live stream on this someday. Like we had some staircases. Well, they were huge and they were insanely heavy. Well, I used fusion or they would have been insanely heavy. Um, I used fusion to basically generatively design these stairs to have all these little cutouts. So they were still strong enough to hold um, a certain amount of weight, but they were light enough that you could move them quickly as they're doing set changes and stuff. So, um, and then Kevin mentioned, you know, doing furniture, uh, the same school asked me to design and build um, podiums for all of their classrooms. And the first time I did it, I was using like my bandsaw and a router and all this kind of stuff. And I didn't mock it up in CAD or whatever. And they turned out okay. But after a while, some, some were breaking. And I was pretty frustrated because I thought I did a really good job, you know, building these things. Well, I found out that the teachers were like leaning on the podiums and after a while, just putting that much weight on them were, was making the top break. So the second time they asked for, for more for the other classrooms, I designed it in Fusion, did the FEA and put like a couple hundred pounds of force on the, on the top of it and found out that the little gusset plates I had used were just too small. 
Um, and then, by then, I built my own CNC machine. I did the tool paths in Fusion, sent it right to the machine. And what took like two months the first time, I was able to build in like a couple of weeks with using Fusion. And none of them have been returned broken or anything like that. So that's kind of a, you know, a, a cool thing about being able to design in Fusion and verify that things are going to work even before cutting a single piece. So it was pretty now, cool. Did, yeah. Didn't you also... Uh, like redesign your bathroom or something and, yeah. and render so, it. I thought I remembered watching a, a yeah. tutorial on that. Yeah, so that's a good point. Yeah, for for Daniel. Um, so we wanted to remodel our master bathroom. We had what we called the telephone booth shower. It was very small, um, and so I I mocked the whole thing up. We tried tile going horizontally, tile going vertically. And then we found out that we liked the tile going vertically, which would have been, you know, a huge mistake if we started going, eh, it doesn't look all that great, you know. And I was able to, to know exactly how many tiles, how many were going to get cut, all that kind of stuff, um, and do realistic renders so I could show my wife, you know, who likes the visual kind of thing. And, and uh, we were able, even before we spent a single penny, we were able to kind of show what we wanted. Um, so, yeah, it was kind of a, kind of a fun project. So, so yeah, I mean, I would say you can, you can use it for architectural design. I don't know if I would design a house with it, but you know, if you need to design a deck, sure. You know, if you need to remodel a bathroom or a basement or something like that, absolutely. But, um, you know, if you're designing an airport or something like that, I would probably use, you know, Revit or, or, uh, you know, AutoCAD architectural or something like that. So good questions. Um, so let me see. Um, so Kevin, what is your, since you have a YouTube channel, what are some of your other YouTube channels that you will follow? I appreciate that you watch our video. So <laughs> yeah. Kevin, what are some of the other ones that you watch? Um, so yeah, if you don't count yours, I would say one of my favorites um, because of my hobby of woodworking uh, would be the Shaper Origin channel. So for those not familiar, uh, the Shaper Origin is a handheld CNC router that basically has a computer built in so it'll automatically correct and kind of adapt to how you're moving it. It's like the most fascinating machine once you try it. Um, but I'm just blown away by the projects they showcase because um, a lot of the people they showcase are like full full time woodworkers or, or designers. And just how they can take this amazing machine, but come up with such these clever ways to use it to like assist in their process, not to like take over the whole process and, you know, just put plywood on a, a big CNC and have it cut everything out and, you know, do it all. That just like blows me away. So I, I love when they sometimes, not always, but sometimes they'll kind of showcase how the file was built in Fusion. Um, and kind of what their thought process was, which I think is really cool. Uh, the other one that I have written down here, there's actually a newer channel. Uh, I can't remember the guy's name, but the channel is called Stuff Made Here. And he actually just started posting, I think about two months ago. And he uh, he created this, this video that went viral and it was, uh, a little basketball hoop where no matter how you threw the ball at it, it that. would make it go in. And I just thought that was like the coolest project to begin with. But then I remember watching the video and all of a sudden I see fusion in the background. Mm -hmm. And then later it like comes up again and just seeing how he had figured out like all these things in fusion before he went off to try and make it. And I was just like, Oh, this is incredible. Like this is such a cool project. And, I think he like overnight gained like thousands of subscribers and a couple of his videos now have gone like viral. And then anyone that follows uh, Mark Grober, mm -hmm. who does a lot of cool videos and also uses Fusion, he uh, he actually was like commenting on the guy's videos like, oh, we mm -hmm. should do this project together or like different things like that. So, yeah, I, I saw that same video and, you know, it's it blows me away how many people are using Fusion to solve you know, if, for example, that backboard is basically a parabolic backboard. And I'm like, that's right. not going to work. And he showed throwing balls from all these different directions and they were going. And I'm like, that's the coolest thing ever. And then he took it to the next level and made it, 
you know yeah and actually early, tilt and yeah, yeah tilt with stepper motors and the programming and stuff like that um the i like to make stuff channel i think he uses fusion for some of the stuff you mentioned mark yep. rover um it's uh there's there's even a channel they do like video editing type stuff like special effects and they use fusion yeah, to make yeah. um like a gopro mounts and all this kind of stuff mm -hmm. so it's it's fun to see it out there and hey i'm part of that team you know <laughs> so pretty pretty cool um okay so i'm going through seeing what people are asking here um Okay, so okay, so this one, this one's again for me, <laughs> I guess. Um, so Seabreeze Coffee Roasters asked, uh, "When is Fusion Three Hundred and Sixty going to take text text seriously?" So this is a good question. We get this one a lot. For example, text on a curve, text on a path, all that kind of stuff. I I side with you. I totally agree. I wish we could do that. We can't right now. Um, we are working on solutions for that. But what's interesting is, you know, Fusion is a, you know, product design, you know, manufacturing type tool. There's other tools like Corel Draw, Illustrator, you know, those are aimed for certain niche areas. Well, so is Fusion a little bit. It's kind of aimed at a certain niche area. And so we don't do a lot of graphic design, um, but we do get asked a lot. You know, I want to 3D print something that has text on a curve. I want to engrave text on the side of a, a product or whatever. So we are um, doing some effort into that. Oops, sorry. Um, so keep your eyes open. One of the thing, one of my favorite things with Fusion is the fact that the um, the product team listens to the community. We have um, the, the forums where people can post ideas and stuff, and that's what they take a look at and see what's important. And the fact that since we're cloud enabled, we can push out releases you know, every couple of weeks with new functionality. For example, we just added the ability to sketch in drawings. So you know, if you wanna make a custom symbol or you wanna highlight an area that says keep clear for a sticker or something like that, we, we used to not be able to do that. But because the community said, hey, I need to be able to, to do that kind of stuff, we've added that into the product. So, um, yep, keep your eyes open. Uh, I don't know when, but um, I know they are working on it. The solution I usually provide is um, if you need to do like curved text or text on a path, you can use a free product called Inkscape and bring that SVG into Fusion and you can do some pretty cool stuff with it. Um, and there's actually a lot of YouTube videos now on um, creating like curved text or text on a surface using sheet metal, believe it or not, um, to, to wrap text around. So, so good question there. Um, okay, let me see. Any question? Do you have any questions for us, Kevin, while I'm looking through the list? Or Yeah, there is one for uh, Kevin from Ohio uh, Teen Tech. It says... Kevin, would you ever plan on designing a castle in Fusion? Um, that's an interesting question. Is the castle for three D printing, or a life size castle, or or what is the uh, the context? Great, great question. Yeah, uh, maybe Ohio Teen Tech can uh, put that in the chat. <laughs> So, I mean, so, I mean, I can help answer that question too. Is like somebody asked, can you do architectural and stuff? So if it's for 3d printing, fusion is awesome for that. Uh, I've even done a live stream on how to create like special textures on the side of objects and stuff to, you know, if you're into like dungeons and dragons or HO trains or something like that, you can design these products, um, you know, buildings, outbuildings, you know, all kind of stuff in fusion 360. If you're talking, you know, full blown, full size castle or something like that, I don't know. You, I probably not use Fusion for that. <laughs> That's just you yeah. can render it, you can make it look cool and stuff. But I, I really liked your tutorial on the use of mud box and yeah. having. Because I that's one question that I I get asked all the time is how do I create like a brick texture or right. how do I do this and that, and it's hard to to respond by saying don't use fusion, you know, cause it's like, you don't want to tell the, the person who's trying to learn fusion to not use fusion. But I think 
to go off that, it, it's a good point that like, you have to kind of understand what the tool is designed for and what the limitations are. But one thing that I constantly find myself telling people, and this, especially when I've worked with like uh, industrial design students or other or people in school, is that you never want to let the tool kind of dictate your design. You always want to come up with your design and figure out how to get it, you know, created. And I see that all the time with CAD programs. And you kind of touched on it briefly with, with the HP printers, how you could literally see the evolution over time, how things changed. And it, it's a tricky thing to do, but you know, we see this a lot with like design students, especially because they'll come up with like a sketch and then they'll go into Fusion or SolidWorks or whatever they're using. And they'll say, well, I don't know how to use these tools. So you know what, I'm gonna change the design. I'm no longer gonna make it look like this. And all of a yeah. sudden their final design doesn't solve for what they actually initially kind of came up with. Um, so I think, yeah, going off of that, like it, it's totally fine to use Mudbox or maybe even create a file in Fusion and put it in Blender or some other mesh modeler mm -hmm. or 3DS Max or Maya or something else to where you can kind of take it to another level in a different realm. You know, I think yeah. that's what makes things powerful is when you understand that like your workflow can be, you know, totally different directions based on what you need. Yep. Use the tools that you have to, to make the, the, the whole product. It doesn't mean you're only limited to a hammer, right? You're, you have a bunch of tools. So I, I totally agree with your statement there. And that actually is going to lead me into, I would say kind of a tough question for you. For both of you guys, where do you see the future of CAD going? I'll, I'll let Angelo go first because I'm, <laughs> I'm curious what he has in mind. Uh, automation comes to mind, uh, doing things or allowing people with less experience to be able to do things easier. I look back at photography, look at something like photography. Uh, 10, 15, 20 years ago, you needed some photography. You would have to hire somebody that had the equipment. Now we all have a very suitable camera in our pocket on our cell phone, along with all the software that we can do filters and all of that stuff. The other thing is uh, like uh, creating documents. When uh, computers came out, we had, uh, you're, you're able to now do your own printing. You can print on that HP printer. Uh, you can do all your, create all your documents yourself. You don't have to go to uh, an outside place to create your documents. So with CAD and modeling and design uh, products like Fusion uh, to allow more, more, more access or more people to access the tools to just have design easier for people that come up with the design uh, where, you know, you think back 20 years ago, 30 years ago. If you had a product design idea, you wouldn't even know where to start or let alone make it. Now, uh, with what uh, Kevin is doing and showing you could design something in Fusion, print it at home in your, you know, on your uh, printer, uh, 3D printer, things like that, or make it on your desktop mill or things like that. So uh, for me, what I see is just more access and automation and things happening easier. Yeah, I think it's it's really exciting to see um, how 3D printing becoming more popular with consumers has made CAD more popular mm -hmm. as a result of that. And how, again, it kind of is helping get rid of that stigma that CAD is only for someone who's a machinist or super nerdy or is like super serious about, you know, creating high tech stuff and you know, how someone, and, and I think even programs like Tinkercad, which is an Autodesk program, I've seen kids that are like seven years old come up with like the most creative designs that I never myself could have come up with. And then an hour later, it's 3D printed and it's in their hand. And it's just like so fascinating. Uh, the other thing I'll say um, that excites me, I guess, with the future of CAD is the use of uh, AR and, and VR. Uh, so you guys have seen like the, the Microsoft HoloLens. Mm -hmm. um, from an industrial design standpoint, 
Like that is like the most fascinating thing to be able to have that on and you're working on like the one of the examples they did in one of their videos is they have this motorcycle virtually in front of them and they need to redesign some of the parts and they're able to actually design the part like they're actually physically working on it right in front of them which is just incredible because again i think that takes away that limitation of now you can have a team of designers and engineers around the globe they don't all need to be in the same warehouse or office building or room collaborating they can all kind of add you know value wherever they are um and then the last thing i'll say is that you touch on generative design which is already like incredible and so fascinating but I'm, I'm excited to see five years from now or even 10 years from now how far computers kind of evolve and how that will result in generative design becoming more of the norm and as like a designer being able to sit down and say hey here's the requirements like let the computer do the heavy lifting and see what it can come up with and then we'll take you know some of the best results and kind of you know, evolve those into something. Uh, Cause I think that even to this day, like it's incredible to be able to have so many choices and things generated for you that you could never, even if you spent a year, you probably couldn't sit there and have come up with all those same ideas. So it's just crazy that in an hour or so you can have all those ideas generated for you. Yeah, I was gonna say the exact same thing. I, I see the future of CAD honestly leaning a little bit toward what we're doing with generative design. And if you guys haven't seen what Autodesk is doing with it, uh, do a YouTube search for uh, generative design. It'll blow you away. And kind of like what Kevin was saying, as an engineer, I can come up with some constraints, some requirements. I, I need these holes to stay you know, a certain size. I need it to withstand this much stress. I want to make it out of titanium, aluminum you know, a bunch of different kinds of materials. And then the computer goes through and figures out how to meet those requirements, uh, make it lighter, make it stronger, you know, whatever. And then what I think I'm, I'm impressed with the most with what Autodesk is doing is the different manufacturing methodologies. And a neat example of this is, and we have it in one of our videos, um, they were, they're machining a huge propeller for like a, a, a ship. I mean, this thing is huge. Well, back in the day, you would start out with this huge chunk of metal and you would sit there and you'd cut all that metal away just to have these three thin propellers, right? Well, now with additive and subtractive, they're actually 3D printing metal and then coming back and then machining that just slightly. And so instead of like 96% of waste, they're getting like 2% of waste or something like that. And to me, that's huge, right? Instead of just throwing all that stuff away. So I think it's going to change how things are designed. You're going to start to see lighter airplanes, which means less carbon output. You're going to see, um, you know, stronger elements being used and stuff. So, um, you know, maybe these wind turbines are going to be smaller because they can withstand the stresses or whatever, you know, stuff like that. So that's kind of where I see CAD. The, the VR stuff I think is really cool. I saw a neat video where they were doing like T-splines and he was just using the, the little um, hollow lens handle or whatever. And he was just like pulling surfaces in 3D and he was able to walk around this. It was, I think it was a car, if I'm not mistaken, and kind of move these surfaces around. It was, it was pretty cool. So Yeah, it, if anyone's interested in experimenting with that, there's a uh, Oculus app called Gravity Sketch that I've played around with and it's pretty affordable. I mean, I think the app's only like 20 bucks or something. And, you know, you can, a, a lot of actually libraries or other places have Oculuses that you can check out or, or try or rent. Um, so you, you can find a way to kind of access one without even having to buy it. But it's incredible to be able to just have these things in your hand and literally like virtually essentially stretch and pull things and just create them like it's a totally different like mindset than like something like fusion or any cad program but it's also at the same time it's so cool because you can walk around the design you can really like look at things in like a different perspective mm -hmm. and i think like from a design standpoint you you gain that sense of scale that's sometimes hard to get with fusion and that's one thing like i'm always 
kind of preaching to people is like, don't forget or don't be afraid to just like test your 3D prints because a lot of times we forget when we're looking at it on a, a big 30 inch monitor that it's actually, you know, only yeah. half an inch big um, and things are going to be different. But that's one thing with like VR that I think is kind of cool is you have more of that sense of scale of like what you're actually creating. Yeah, so funny story. I have a lot of funny stories. Um, I was helping one of the local high schools um, design a full-size electric race car. Um, there's something called Electrophone America, and you design these, you know, these electric cars basically to go as fast and as far as you can in exactly one hour. And so it's great for high schools because it's engineering, it's financing, it's um, you know testing the product and all that kind of stuff. And so. I went to one of these high schools, was helping them design their car, and I was showing them how to design it in CAD and all that kind of stuff. And then I came back a couple weeks later, and they had built it out of PVC pipe. And I was like, oh, show me your CAD model. And they're like, oh, we haven't drawn it yet. We actually started with the PVC pipe because the exact same thing you said. They started drawing it on the screen, but it was only this big. And they couldn't visualize what it was going to look like. So they mocked it up first, put the, you know, they put the students in it, figured out where the seat should be and the steering wheel should be and then they designed it in CAD I'm like okay I, I can see that but it was just kind of like opposite of what you would expect so yeah but that is a good point though I'll just touch on that briefly like I, I often recommend like I, I've seen especially a lot of beginners that are just learning CAD for the first time or fusion um, they want to just jump right in and it you know it's exciting to just start creating stuff but sometimes you find it helpful to just sit down and pull out a piece of scratch paper or notebook and just kind of sketch things out and kind of think some things through before you even, you know, start doing anything because that'll help you one, avoid errors um, and kind of issues, but also you'll just save time then when you actually do start modeling because you won't be kicking yourself in the foot like, ah, I don't need all this that I just did in the last hour. I'll just trash that and, you know, start over. So yeah. it's, I mean, I think like, it's funny that you said they, they mocked it up like in real life. I mean, they may have learned several things from actually sitting in that, that like you said, when they, if they did it in fusion, they may have lost that context of how it's like to actually sit in there. So that's right. a pretty cool example. Yeah. Um, so we are at the top of the hour. Um, Kevin, you know, I, I'm going to end with one. I think one of the coolest things I think is, that you are an evangelist for the product and you don't even work for Autodesk, right? You have a passion. Um, in fact, I think you're even wearing a Fusion shirt, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, yep. I decided to wear <laughs> yep. a Fusion shirt today. So. I mean, the fact that, you know, you're not benefiting from Autodesk or anything like that, that you love this product so much that you're willing to share your knowledge with other people, I think is huge. And there's many people like that. In fact, one of the things I'm impressed with is some of the people that actually watch our live streams are starting to do their own live streams in their countries and stuff like that. I think that's so awesome. Um, in fact, I saw a question is like, um, you know, how popular is fusion in Asia? Well, I don't personally know the answer to that. I, I know that we have a, quite a few customers that are using it. And um, if it's if there's people like you yourself, you know, that are evangelizing this product because they know how powerful it is, how easy it is to learn what it can do and stuff, it's just going to grow exponentially. So I appreciate you doing what you do. I watch your videos. I think it's funny you watch mine. Um, you know, it's... It, Angelo, we, we're on calls all the time with customers and he'll ping me, I didn't know you could do that. And then I'm like, I didn't know you could do that. You know, it was really kind of cool. I mean, we're, we're constantly yeah. learning. And I think that's that's the passion that I get from watching your videos is that you have this this knowledge of a particular product and you're, you're sharing that with others. So I thank you uh, for, for doing that. So everybody watching, make sure you go to Kevin's channel, um, subscribe if you haven't, you're gonna learn a ton. Um, from his content. I really like how he's broken it down. Um, so definitely, definitely, definitely watch those videos. Uh, make sure you subscribe to our channel. We're doing live streams almost on a daily basis now. Um, you know, and, and you got to hear how we come up with the topics. It's, it's literally from you guys um, and gals that are watching that's, that we come up with these different topics. So with that, I want to thank Kevin. I want to thank Angelo. Angelo helping out with the, the chat and stuff. Um, if you have any other questions for any of us, please feel free to post them into the comments of 
the YouTube channel. We'll try to monitor those for the next couple of days and, and respond if we can. So with that, everybody, thank you so much. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you, Angelo. And have a good rest of your day. Cheers, everyone.